a última mesa dessa, dessa, desse dia, de sexta-feira. Vamos convidar os palestrantes para fazerem parte da mesa. O doutor Paulo Roberto vai, vai fazer, então, a, a apresentação da mesa. Boa tarde a todos. Ah, gostaria de agradecer inicialmente a comissão organizadora, a, a escolha do meu nome para presidir a mesa e, sobretudo, por me dar a honra de compartilhá-la com Ivanésio, com Maria de Lúcia Sebel, com é, Maris Muniz e com Crislane Siston. Eu vou passar aos dois moderadores a responsabilidade de chamar os apresentadores, porque quem preside, preside e fica calado no seu canto. Bom, então, vamos é, iniciar a mesa. Nós vamos ter uma troca é, de algumas apresentações que o, o doutor Sandri, o nosso diretor científico da Nacional, pediu para ser relacionado como o último palestrante. Então, é, ele tem autoridade para isso. Então, certamente, o Sandri vai ficar como o último palestrante. Vamos convidar a doutora... Jade Hiramoto, que vai nos então falar sobre o tratamento das veias varicosas usando a ablação por radiofrequência. Obrigada por estar aqui hoje. Varicose veins é um problema muito comum e nos Estados Unidos isso afeta cerca de um terço da população de adultos. A prevalência dessa doença é maior em mulheres do que em homens, e porque é um problema tão comum, é muito difícil ascertar os fatores específicos para essa doença. Mas a maioria das mulheres que você vê vão dizer que os seus sintomas ficaram piores durante a gravidez, e a maioria dos pacientes vão reportar a história de uma doença de família. Qual é a doença de pathologia? Bem, nas veias veins normais, você tem uma valve intacta que permite o fluxo distal de água normal, 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 que permite o fluxo this valve, but in the abnormal system, because of failure of the valve or, or weakness of the valve, blood refluxes uh, distally, causing distension, venous hypertension, which can then lead to varicosity, spider veins, dermatitis, and pain. Again, it can be from failure or congenital weakness of the valves. You can oftentimes have deep venous uh, obstruction that leads to overwork of the superficial veins, and reflux can be in any of the uh, saphenous Uh, in the superficial venous systems. Reflux in the saphenous vein can also engorge the deep system through perforators, and distension of the valves in the deep veins can actually cause reflux in the deep system. And what's interesting to note is that uh, treatment of the superficial reflux can actually correct the deep venous reflux in about half of those patients. This is uh, the consensus classification standard uh, for chronic venous disease, the SEEP classification. Uh, it does not assess um, or classify subjective symptoms such as pain, aching, or heaviness, but it is uh, a standard way of reporting chronic venous disease. Uh, these are the uh, components of the SEEP classification. If you want something that's going to more objectively uh, classify the severity of the disease, you can use the Venus Clinical Severity Score. It was designed as a complement for the SEEP classification, and it's uh, important to use if you're longitudinally following patients or enrolling patients in a clinical study. In evaluating these patients, it's really important to get a, a very good history, uh, especially paying close attention to whether or not they've had a history of a deep vein thrombosis, any episodes of superficial thrombophobitis, uh, and any previous uh, therapy and their response to therapy. You want to make sure to exclude the presence of a deep vein thrombosis, uh, an AV fistula or malformation, a mass that can cause venous obstruction. Patients with klippel trenowney weber syndrome can have a very abnormal or absent deep venous system, and so they're relying entirely on their superficial venous system, so ablating that could be a problem. And you want to make sure that you exclude the presence of peripheral arterial disease. <laughs> 
All of our patients get a very detailed preoperative duplex study. This is a really important component for us in terms of evaluating our patients. The diagnosis of reflux is made if there's reversal of flow in the superficial venous system. That's over half a second following a provocative maneuver. But when you evaluate these patients, you'll find that their median at, uh, time of reflux is closer to about two to four seconds. In this ultrasound, the uh, sonographer will define all of the incompetent pathways in all of the superficial systems as well as the deep system. Um, they'll also assess for the presence of a DVT or superficial thrombophobitis. And in those superficial veins that do have reflux, they'll create a map for us with the vein diameter and the depth of the vein. And they'll also mark any areas that have severe tortuous segments. So the indications for treatment, we have to have proven reflux on an ultrasound evaluation as well as some associated symptom, whether it be painful varicose veins, edema, aching. Um, it can be quite subjective and quite a range, but they do have to have symptoms in addition to proven reflux. Uh, again, contraindications. Um, Deep venous obstruction, if a patient has an occlusive DVT, I do not think they're good candidates for saphenous vein ablation. However, if they have a previous history of a DVT and have recanalized flow in that deep system, especially in like a popliteal vein, um, I will still treat those patients. What are the specific contraindications to thermal ablation? If you have um, a very thin woman with a superficial saphenous vein that's closely adherent to the skin, those patients are usually pretty bad patients to treat because you can cause a thermal injury and or hyperpigmentation uh, along the um, ablated vein. If there's excessive tortuosity, it's gonna be very difficult to track that catheter into and up that vein. And if there's any evidence of thrombus in the superficial venous system, whether it's chronic or superficial, you don't want to risk pushing that thrombus into the femoral vein. Some things to consider, if the greater saphenous vein is very dilated uh, or aneurysmal, especially in the proximal portion of that vein, uh, you might want to consider some other therapy, like traditional ligation and stripping. Um, aspirin and Plavix has been looked at, and there's really been no evidence to suggest that there's decreased safety or efficacy in those patients on dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, patients on Coumadin, that was a concern for all of us, but I think the literature would uh, suggest that there's no difference in the short-term outcomes in terms of um, successful vein occlusion. Uh, this is the system that we use, the venous uh, system for radiofrequency ablation. Uh, this is the, the generator. Uh, the radiofrequency energy is delivered through the catheter to the vein wall. It uh, heats the vein wall, causing the collagen to contract and basically fibrotic sealing of the, the vein. And this is just a cartoon schematic of that. So after we've evaluated our patient, they're in the operating room. Obviously, you can do this in the office or in the operating room. After the patient's prepped and draped, with a sterile ultrasound, I scan from the saphenofemoral junction to the access point, which is usually just below the knee. If you go any lower, you risk um, uh, injury to the saphenous nerve. Uh, and we scan from the saphenofemoral junction, paying attention to any aneurysmal or tortuous segments, any areas where there's large branches, or any areas where the vein becomes very superficial. And this is really the perfect vein to treat. It's in that fascial compartment. It's well below the skin. Um, this is a nice vein to treat. Um, we get ultrasound-guided access using a micropuncture needle. It's nice to warm the patient uh, in the room and place them in reverse Trendelenburg. Some of these um, you know, young, healthy patients can uh, encounter a lot of venous spasm if they're in a cold room. A seven French sheath is placed into the vein below the knee. Um, the catheter, the closure fast catheter, uh, has um, a, a bumper and shaft markers, and we advance the catheter uh, just to about two centimeters distal to the saphenofemoral junction. Tumescent anesthesia is your friend. Um, I use a combination of 1% lidocaine uh, with epinephrine in uh, saline. It, uh, I use a lot of it. It's uh, nice, it provides some local anesthetic, but it also serves to compress the vein, and it's very helpful to move some of these superficial veins to um, greater than a centimeter below the skin surface to protect against this thermal skin injury. Finally, once you have your catheter in place, the patient's placed in Trendelenburg. Uh, we do one final check um, of the tip position, and then as we ablate, we're putting gentle pressure with the ultrasound probe in a longitudinal uh, um, manner along the course of the vein.
Again, this is a segmental ablation technology, so you're treating seven centimeters of the vein all at once during a 20-segment treatment cycle. I treat the proximal segment twice, as well as any vein segments that have large branches or any dilated uh, segments of the vein. And if you have a 45 centimeter segment of vein, it takes about three to five minutes. Um, a couple of uh, issues, if the vein is very tortuous, you want to make sure that you get help with a, a, a guide wire. The venous catheter is a, li a little unusual because it's a 0 0.25 uh, lumen, so you don't have a ton of uh, wires that you can use. Um, but you might need a guide wire to actually get your catheter past a tortuous segment. If you can't get access, uh, what I've done is just get access right above the tortuous segment, strip the segment below, and then ablate um, the segment to the saphenofemoral junction. If you're treating a large branch of the greater saphenous vein or a duplicated greater saphenous vein, I would get sheath access to both branches prior to tumescence because you're going to encounter a lot of venous spasm once you inject the tumescence. It's going to be very difficult to get access to that second brain or that large vein branch. Uh, right after the ablation, we check for patency of the common femoral vein to make sure that there's no thrombus and confirm closure of the saphenous vein. All of these patients in our practice then get a routine ultrasound 48 to 72 hours after the uh, procedure. This is the compression dressing that we use, which stays on for two days. And these are pretty much typical results. In my practice, I do all these cases in the operating room, and so about over 90% of the patients will want an adjunctive phlebectomy at this time which I think um, uh, results in a very nice cosmetic result. This, um, these are some of the post-operative adverse events that can occur. Um, I would say that maybe about half of the patients will complain of a little bit of numbness along the distribution of the ablated saphenous vein. That usually goes away in about six to eight weeks. Um, but probably the most important complication that we worry about is a DVT. Uh, I, have had the incidence is about one to three percent. When this occurs, it's usually thrombus that's just a, from the saphenofemoral junction into the common femoral vein. I haven't seen occlusive thrombus in the femoral vein. Uh, I put these patients on Lovenox uh, for a week, and uh, usually after a week of Lovenox, a repeat ultrasound will show complete regression of this back into the saphenous vein. How does radiofrequency ablation compare to ligation and stripping? I think that the, the literature would support that the results are uh, comparable or even better with faster recovery, less postoperative pain, and less tissue damage. What about compared to laser ablation? Um, I think that in the earlier days of radiofrequency ablation, when there was this continuous pullback technology with the closure plus catheter, the results were not as good as with the laser. However, uh, with the newer catheter, the closure fast catheter, there's more uniform heating of the vein in that segment. And um, the recent randomized studies comparing RFA to laser ablation would suggest that the success rates are equal uh, for RFA and laser ablation. And it's been pretty consistent that there is a slightly less postoperative pain and quicker return to work in the RFA group compared to the laser group. And these are the other two randomized studies. So in conclusion, endovenous uh, radiofrequency ablation, it's very safe and effective in the treatment of venous insufficiency in varicose veins. I think the most important thing is to perform a preoperative uh, evaluation, um, which includes a very detailed ultrasound study because, especially if you're performing this in the office, you want to know which patients uh, you're going to be able to successfully uh, treat. Thank you very much.